Greg Potter, uh, been on for 27 years. I hired in 1988. And you're a district chief? Oh, yeah, I'm a district chief. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a district chief away. since, uh, <laughs> let's see, 2010. Uh, I'm Dan Merce. I've been on the fire department 22 years. I've been a district chief now, I guess, about five and a half years. And I've been here in District 2 for the last four. So in Cincinnati, we have uh, 26 firehouses. Uh, we have 26 engine companies and 12 truck companies. We also have 12 medic units at, uh, spread out throughout the city. Um, all those houses are strategically spread out throughout the city and they all have their own area that they you know, preside over. And basically, so like for instance, we have the threes here. If there's a fire in between here and the 14s area, the threes would respond, the 14s would, would respond, probably the 29s and we'd have uh, two engines and three trucks respond to that fire, um, that particular incident. So basically we kind of do a divide and conquer. We try to spread, you know, have houses all over the city. That way they can respond to any given area uh, in a timely and effective fashion. Dan St. John, um, Cincinnati Fire Department Lieutenant Paramedic, uh, traveling right now in District 3. When the call comes in, no matter what time of day it is, um, you just beat feet to the apparatus floor, to the, to the uh, apparatus that you're riding on, throw your gear on, 
get it on as quick as you can. That's what we practice on. Get that on before you, you get in the truck. You know, get everything hooked up. Get on the apparatus and um, make sure with me being the, uh, the lieutenant of the vehicle, I've got to make sure that everybody's safely in the vehicle and seat belted. And, and then we have to know where we're going. Um, obviously, we have computers, laptops in there now on my side. And, and if it's a regular driver, normally they know where they're going. Um, guys are great about that. You know, if guys have been in certain areas for a while, they know without even looking it up. Um, so you have that, and then you have the computer. You got to find a place. Uh, you got to listen to radio traffic. You got to know what radio channel that this incident is going to be on. And you've got to convey that to your um, fellow firefighters to know what channel they're on. You're constantly listening. Um, we're going to find a fire hydrant if I'm on the engine company. And then I'm going to let them know where it's at, who's going to grab the fire hydrant when we get there. We're going to stop, let one of them off. He's going to grab the hydrant. Uh, we call that laying off. He's going to get out, pull the hose off, signal to the driver that he's ready. And he's going to pull up to the fire. And um, then myself and the other roughneck, the other firefighter, will get out. I'll usually take a uh, thermal imaging camera and a halogen tool and uh, head, try to find the best e or entrance to the fire if it's not obvious. Um, we'll go up and find it where the other roughneck will let him know which attack line that we're going to get to pull off and, and head towards the building. These fire lines are coming in here, they're coming across here and they tie into the standpipe over here which is what feeds the, the fire line that they used to put the fire out with upstairs. Connection there is what we call a standpipe connection. So that's how they get water to the standpipes upstairs. So all they can do is carry the hose upstairs and attach onto the upstairs with the hose and then take it to where the fire set the dry hose all the way up through the building. So we hook lines into that and it charges the whole building system. So what we're doing now is we're trying to clear the smoke out of the building. So until they get that done, they really, because the alarm will keep going up because the smoke detectors are still sensing it. You never know, that could take a while, but they'll start releasing companies. Like right now, I can see some of them are draining hoses. You see the water flying out of the back of here. So they're starting to drain some of the lines down, uh, and then it'll start picking up and slowly getting them out of here. And if, you know, they, they, like right now, they have two alarms here, so they'll probably get rid of the second alarm here shortly, which is, we were on the second alarm, uh, although the chief put us on it right away, but we, he might keep us here for a little bit. You know, it's hard to say. I mean, we might be here, we're gonna be here at least another half hour. We could be here another couple of hours. Sometimes on those scenes, you don't feel like you have as much control. When you're on a fire company, a lot of times you have a lot, feel like you have a lot more control than that smaller piece that you are with those guys. You know, whether you have a hose line or you're doing a search and rescue, you kind of control what you're doing if you feel like you need to get out or this or that. For, for us, a lot of times we're relying on the information that they're giving us outside to make those decisions and watching what we're, you know, we want them to do their job to protect the property and the lives of the people they're going in to help. But it's a fine line of when is it getting too dangerous for them to be in there and get them out of there. Uh, my name is John Davis, Jr. And I'm a lieutenant with the Cincinnati Fire Department. So a lot of the times what will happen is you would get your one alarm and you have so many companies that will respond um, on that one alarm. And we got a lot of companies too. But if you get there and the first person that gets there, they confirm that we do have a working fire. Um, what will knock off a second alarm or a third or fourth alarm typically is high occupancy. If there's a collapse with a fire, you may knock that off. Uh, if it's hot, like extremely hot for manpower, you can, people, you know, people are gonna work a shorter period of time, you'll knock off a second alarm. If the fire is beyond the control of the initial uh, companies that you have, then you're gonna do it. Um, if there's other exposures, like other buildings um, that could be affected, or they have been affected, you're gonna knock that second alarm off, especially if those other buildings have more people in it. So. 
Um, if it's just your regular residential fire and there's four people in there and four people sitting in the grass and there's a regular old one room burner, that'll probably be a one alarm. But if you have an apartment building and the fire's on the first or maybe the, the sixth floor and you got 14 floors and there's a lot of people and that fire is going up floors or it's affecting other floors, you're going to knock off maybe two, you may knock off two or three alarms. So is that, that scope of how many people you need depends on how big the emergency is and it does change. What happens initially is, and I don't know if you saw it, it originally came as just an alarm drop. An alarm drop is somebody's smoke detector went off, it notified their alarm company, it notifies us. If you get nothing else besides an alarm drop, we originally sent two companies, engine company and truck company. And then when they were en route, they also received a smoke detector, so they sent everybody. First thing companies get here and they'll bring up what they call standpipe equipment. They'll come up on the elevator to about four floors below the fire. Then they'll get off and walk the steps because you don't want to open an elevator up and all of a sudden the fire's right there in your cop. So they'll get off like four floors below and then they'll come down here. They actually came that stairwell, but I'll show you the stairwell. Well, what happened was it came in an alarm drop and then while we were waiting to get that elevator, several of the companies then came up through the stairs. You obviously see all the equipment they have on a tank, all their clothes, and then they bring up hose too. So you're carrying up probably somewhere around 100 pounds to the 13th floor. They have hose that they'll hook to this standpipe. These are in hallways, I'm sure you've seen these And then we'll feed water from the hydrant and the pumper into that system. They'll hook up there, and that way you're only running the hose from this floor right to the fire instead of from 11 floors down. Teamwork is the utmost thing, I think, in the fire department. I mean, it's um, you can't put a fire out by yourself. I mean, you, you technically can, but um, large-scale incidents, uh, car wrecks, medical emergencies, you need everybody on board. And this hand knows what this hand is doing. And um, it's just essential that you have this unity and that you know that you can count on this man or this woman and you, they're gonna be able to help you and assist you to get the outcome that we desire, which is to save lives and property. And I don't think there's too many individuals in the CFD. Um, everybody works together and teamwork to me is, I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it's, it's, it's very important. You've got to have that um, concept of teamwork. So it's gotta, it's gotta come together. So what we had was uh, heavy smoke conditions on 11. The smoke was about halfway packed down. And you can see the, the soot around the door here. This is how it presented to us like that. The door, the door was secured, but we, had, we actually did get a key from the property owner. So we, we hooked up our pipe. You want to? They already got it. Oh, that? Okay. Yeah. We hooked up the orange hose to our standpipe, two sections with a nozzle, masked up. Uh, opened the door, right away we presented with just heavy heat and smoke conditions. We ran into a lot of this furniture right away. First I thought this might have been a, a person, so I checked around, it was just dead. Couldn't really see anything yet. Uh, we saw the glowing uh, embers this way. This brown recliner couch on the right side was Uh, possibly the, the tenants right there so uh, her son was possibly staying here and he was a smoker possibly that may have been the cause. Alright moving back here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, hold on. Hold on. This just be a restroom. Oh, you want, might want to grab this metal yeah. part because that it might smash. Closet and restroom. Yeah it, it's pretty much it looks just like it does out here pretty much. Whenever you're ready we'll, you, mm -hmm. we'll get out of here. Sure. We well, we'll just we'll just follow you out. Stay out of the way.
most of the time we just throw this out the window, but from the 11th floor it wouldn't work. Okay. You can go ahead. Okay. We've got a bunch of trash. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. So you might not want to ride down with more. I had my roommate when I had it. A house, my roommate set my house on fire, and uh, it's amazing that you saw the smoke damage, how much of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have just hold that for a second. Push this out. Oh, it's not that bad. That's a one man deal? Yeah. There's always a possibility there's some ember buried in all of that that's going to flare back up. So we get that stuff out, and just for the residents purpose you know, to be able to get all of that burnt stuff out of his house so when he comes back it looks more presentable so it's a public service in that respect that we do that's all part of it Frank, i've been on 19 years i have never made a high-rise fire ever wow that's how rare that is to have a fire up on the 11th floor that's what you guys are lucky most of them are sprinklers, so they're out by the time we get there. This this building was grandfathered in. It was built before the sprinkler code, so that building is not sprinkler, and they're very lucky that that fire company put that fire out as fast as they did. Because with no sprinklers up on the 11th floor, that thing could have been going really, really good. I mean, yeah, that could have been a big hallway, fire if it didn't get put it out. It wasn't long before that entire hallway was going. And with no sprinkler to keep it in check, it's up to us. I mean, it, that really could have been a bad fire. They, they did a great job putting that out. Make sure that everything's out of the building that is potentially going to catch back on fire and just get things to the point where we don't destroy too much for the investigator but make sure that the fire's out. Some people think that we, we're we just willy-nilly in there and ripping holes in walls but there's a reason for us pulling the drywall down off of the ceiling, opening up the wall, pulling cabinets off of the wall. It's all to make sure that a fire's out. And one of the things that they, they always say is if, if you have a rekindle is you were there, left, and it started back up. That's bad. And <laughs> they say if you haven't made a rekindle, you haven't been a fireman long enough. They say it's going to happen. There's you know tiny little ember inside a wall in the insulation. Eventually it's going to flare back up. So we... That's why we're thorough of pulling the drywall off of the wall and pulling the drywall off of the ceiling and making sure that it's out. We don't we don't want to go back. It looks bad for us. It's bad for whoever owns that building. Now there's potentially significant more damage to the building. So they've had some rekindles have been bigger than the original. Fire. Yeah. So we'll do enough to um, to get it out light it up, we have the investigator do his investigation and then, we'll, and then we'll usually clean up that whole area. We'll chuck everything out of the building. We'll find a window or something, we'll chuck everything out of that window to make sure that all those little embers are gone right. and outside the building and then we'll douse down that pile that's outside the building and make sure that that doesn't flare back up. This is a generator that's unique to this truck. Um, the fuel actually comes off of the diesel fuel tank of the truck. So to start this up, the truck has to be on and you just turn that switch. Okay. Most of them have a gas tank that you have to keep full. This one runs right off of the diesel. It's pretty, it's pretty nice. We call this the rabbit tool. It is used to, you, we'll use a, a hand tool called a Halligan. It's just kind of a pry bar. We'll get a, a little bit of a opening on a door and we'll shove this right in that door opening. And then there's a handle in there. It all works off of hydraulics. It's a pump. And that, that thing will start spreading out and it'll open up a door very easily. That would take a long time with just hand tools. 
So that, especially on like a steel door that would take forever with hand tools, that thing will pop a steel door and a steel frame pretty easily. That's a real handy tool. We'll use that because a lot, a lot of times you get there, say, say it's a fire and person ran out. Well, they didn't bother to make sure that their door was unlocked when they ran out. So now it's locked and we got to get in. Or there's an EMS run and the person's down and can't get to the door and we got to force the door. We'll try to do the least invasive way we can. You break a window if we can, if that's possible. Um, Is it destroys it, the door? Yeah, <laughs> there's. It, it, it causes a lot of damage. Typically what we do at fires is we pull up, um, we go to a hydrant so we can have a water source. One guy jumps out, connects the hydrant, we take off towards right. the fire. Um, I come out, I set all this up so we can pump hose through the lines. Um, the, the two guys, an officer and a roughneck in the back, will grab one of these lines and they'll go into the fire. Um, what I do basically is once they've got the hose fully deployed, I'll, uh, I'll get the pumps working and I'll open one of the lines up and send water through to them. And uh, basically their job is to find the seat of the fire and knock it down. My job is to make sure that they don't run out of water. We start with 500 gallons on here and uh, the, that way they can start spraying water right away if, uh, if they get in there before I get my hydrant uh, supply line established. Otherwise, um, I go to the hydrant right away and fill them up and they knock the fire down. We get a shop in that Finley Market. Uh, it's downtown Cincinnati. It's in uh, over the Rhine area. Um, this is a chance for us to get around and uh, you get to talk to a lot of the local residents that go shopping there also. Um, they have great food down there, they always uh, are always nice people. Uh, we can pretty much get anything we we need for the day at the, at the market. Um, it's fun talking to all the different vendors and, and you always got the, the citizens that come up and talk to you and if they have questions about what's going on in the fire department, they always, they always ask. So it's nice to get out in the community and walk around and talk to everybody. The way our shopping works, the way, the way it works for the firehouse is every morning you come in and if you're at a guy, a house with eight guys or four guys, each guy chips in some money for the day. So if we have a house with eight guys at the house, two companies, say it's an engine and a truck company, um, everybody will throw in $10. And then, so if you have eight guys, now you have $80 to spend for the day. And that's gonna, that's gotta feed your lunch and dinner all eight people so um, that's pretty much how firefighters eat on a daily basis they uh they bring in cash and throw it together and pull it all together and then go out shopping every day every unit every day has to go get whatever they're going to have for today so everybody ends up at the store at some point yep we take turns cooking uh, whoever has night watch cooks so uh you end up with all a variety of stuff and most guys are pretty, and I should say, most firefighters are pretty guys good cooks. Guys is Yeah, it kind of is. So what's your specialty? My specialty to yeah. cook? Yeah, what's your, oh what's man. Your, what's your specialty? Uh, I like making chicken and dumplings, but they never want me to make it, so. I like it. Yeah, I like that. But most of the stuff I would want to cook, I know they wouldn't want to eat, so I just. It's gotten healthier over the years. It's been a long time. <laughs> guys used to, it was all meat and potatoes when I first came in, and now guys are not healthier. Yeah. Not healthier. Uh, routine in the morning is uh, come in, Don't forget. get all your equipment on, you know, make sure your mask and everything's okay. Right. And right. then uh, then we do a uh, drill in the morning, uh, oh, okay. usually for an hour, and then we gotta go do our daily work, which is. Uh, you know, it might be checking hiders, might be doing inspections, that kind of stuff, and then and then go to the store, pick up what you're going to eat, and get back to quarters and make lunch. Mm -hmm. Pretty much takes care of the morning. Yeah, sounds good to me. Well, actually, uh, we were go I think we're going to do our drill. We didn't do it this morning because we want you guys to see it, so we're going to do a drill this oh. afternoon, so you guys oh, can okay. kind of see what we do for that. Excellent. The ladder pipe. I'll point it out. What you need. We'll come out here every once in a while, practice with guys, uh, 
who aren't used to driving, don't drive all the time, but they're what we call second man. Um, if the regular driver's off, he might be required to drive for that day. So just to make sure their skills are good, we'll come out here and practice. pre-piped aerial it's already got the ladder pipe system built into it the older ones we actually have to mount a nozzle up at the end of the aerial and then run a hose up to it uh, all the newer ones we're buying are these pre-pipes which makes it a lot nicer a lot quicker it works better it's kind of hard to tell how much water that would actually be putting on a building normally we'd be right on top we'd be, we'd be closer than your car normally to a building oh, you know yeah. so if you're yeah, and, and like we're shooting a ladder pipe, that's basically over the top of the building. It's only shooting maybe 30, 40 feet, and it's blasting right into the building. Mm -hmm. So we can get a ton of water in, in buildings when we use these things. Just when it's out here in the open, it's kind of hard to get that perspective. So I'm responsible for 10 fire companies, but we could make a fire, both of us together, that could be in on the border. So I could be in charge of district three companies, district one companies. Um, but for the day, when you do, when you manage it and you do manpower and you do leads and things like that, I'm responsible for District 2. So they're in District 2, which is the west side of town. We have Liberty and Lynn, and then pretty much the whole west side of town. So I'll make a fire pretty much, you know, in half the city because we send two chiefs to a fire. So I pretty much will go half of the city. Um, and then the truck company, which Lieutenant Dispenis on, they have a bigger running area than the engine does because we have less truck companies than we do engine companies. Well, no, Zippy was over there. And then Zippy moved up front. Now I got my shoes all muddy. You guys are something else. Something else. Uh, my name is Yamasee Gunagun. I'm a new firefighter probationary until November. Um, I just got out of a last training class. So in November I started and in November I will be a real firefighter. <laughs> I just wish people knew how like fulfilling it was to like know that you, even if you don't have a run that day, like you still have the potential to help somebody in an emergency, in their emergency and just like, Somebody, I was talking to one of the lieutenants who lives nearby me, I ran into him, um, and he summed it up pretty well. He said, you get paid to be a good neighbor, and that's really what we do. Like, we get paid to, like, be nice to people, show them a little bit of compassion, and help them get through their day, and that's, like, the most rewarding thing. Like, even if it's just, like, a little kid with a stubbed toe, and you put a Band-Aid on it, and they're fine, or if it's, you know, a cardiac arrest, and you're doing CPR, and trying to keep the family calm while you try to resuscitate a person like all from the most minor run to the most major like it's all equally rewarding and I just wish that I had I knew more people that wanted to do this as a career because it's the best job well there's a lot of teamwork that goes on outside the fire department obviously all the drilling we do and we did a drill we did a ladder pipe this morning so you drill with your companies because the biggest thing is when you go into this fire you are truly counting on that guy next to you or that girl next to you to save you if you need help. So you have to trust them. And a lot of that is we'll build camaraderie through training, but um, we're such a family. We have events where, you know, these guys in this house, we might all go out together, the wives will go out together, the kids will all be around each other. So we do, part of the camaraderie is that we become family. And so just like we would help this guy out because we work with him, he's, he's our brother, just like you would help out your family member. There'd be no question it's just almost once you get on this job that you're counting on them, it just becomes like a sibling. They're doing ancient record evolutions now. They've got one way to drag it to the first floor, one to drag it to the second floor. Now the company's taking it up to the third floor, just working on a different evolution. So they're going to take out the uh, 
the hose and spray it all out here? Yeah. Well, not out here. They'll do it inside the building. Okay. So is there going to be a fire going? or? No, no, no. live fire at all. Oh. There's certain parameters with NFPA you have to have if you actually have a fire inside of a building. Obviously, in a small environment like this, we're just doing the hose evolution. So no active fire at all, no smoke at all. Just the building itself. This is where uh, all the firemen kind of come to train, or? Yeah, Cincinnati, correct. This is our only, it's called the high intensity fire building. We've got three levels. We can burn in uh, pretty much any level or any room that we want. Um, helps with hose evolutions. We can actually cut holes in the roof up top to practice on ventilation, both horizontal and vertical. We get a lot of use out of the structure. Get there, you're going to stop, let one of them off. He's going to grab the hydrant, uh, we call that laying off. He's going to get out, pull the hose off, signal to the driver that he's ready, and he's going to pull up to the fire. Myself and the other roughneck, the other firefighter, will get out. I'll usually take a uh, thermal imaging camera, a howling tool, and uh, head, try to find the best e or entrance to the fire if it's not obvious. But by that time, there's going to be a whole lot, mostly, there's going to be a whole lot of other guys on the scene pulling hose, grabbing an extra attack line. Um, you know, if you're on a ladder truck, which uh, they, they've got a different set of jobs that they do, you know, if you're an officer or whatever on there, they've, they've got uh, two jobs where two guys are going to put the aerial up, which is the main ladder, and they're going to, if they can, if there's no wires or whatever, and they're going to go up there and they're going to, if they need to, ventilate a hole or cut a hole in the roof to let the smoke up, just like a chimney effect. The other two guys, the officer of that truck company and his roughneck, are going to make entrance into that building that's burning and look for victims if there are any and uh, also help identify where the fire is at. So that's kind of a, I guess, a, a um, little bit of a concept of, from start to beginning and of what we do. Um, there's a little bit more to it, some different tools and different ladders, um, different scenarios, but basically that's, that's how we do it. If there's a collapse with a fire, you may knock that off. Uh, if it's hot, like extremely hot for manpower, you can, people, people are gonna work a shorter period of time, you'll knock off a second alarm. If the fire is beyond the control of the initial. So anytime, and I think when Oscar Armstrong passed, it wasn't something, it, it, the psychology of it is weird, but you'll hear, um, one of the questions that was always asked, but never just asked out in the open when Oscar passed was, who else passed? Did he pass by himself? How did he go in a building by himself? Who was there with him? Did somebody just barely get out? Did they just get out of harm's way and he just happened to get caught? And then when you find out that no, he was in there by himself, that wasn't, um, that wasn't the answer that I don't think any of us, and I mean, this was a conversation I had among my classmates. We all ask the same question. You mean Oscar, you know, he passed, but who else passed with him? So you start, and I mean, sometimes if you ever look at line of duty death, sometimes you'll see there's like building collapses or something like that. You see people may, may pass and um, they used to. Now you're just starting to, uh, they used to pass in pairs. Now you're starting to see people passing by themselves. So that's kind of weird for me because that's always a fear, fear of mine. Not necessarily me passing by, by myself, but if there was somebody, especially with me, uh, and it wouldn't, I wouldn't, that wouldn't sit well with me at all. So that's one of my greatest fears. I don't ever want to see people like that. I don't want to see anybody pass. It just that, that's just, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. It's weird. Well, in my career, there's been two line of duty deaths. Um, one was Oscar and um, one was uh, Daryl Gordon. Daryl just passed away recently last, last April. 
I uh, I did not know Oscar as well. Um, I met him a couple times. He's on a different union, but you still, to this day, you feel the pain, the effects when you hear all the stuff um, with Daryl passing away. There was a little bit of a connection for me. I wasn't at the fire, um, but last year this time, him and I being union representatives of uh, our local uh, union here in Cincinnati, we um, hosted the national convention last summer, this time in July. And uh, Daryl and I worked together a lot and we actually roomed together downtown at the hotel for a week. Uh, we came in and out of the rooms, but we shared this shared this room as like our base uh, as we were doing the work for the convention. And I got to know him. I knew him before that, but that week and that month that we worked together for this event, uh, I witnessed what kind of person he was and the just the, the death that really, you still don't believe it. Um, he was a 30 year vet and everything they say about him was true. Um, it just hits home how serious this job is that you can be on the job for one year or 30 years and it, it doesn't matter. It can take your life and it changed his family forever. You know, his daughter's lost um, dad and his wife lost a husband and we lost a brother and um, I think about it a lot because it could happen to any one of us and you just pray for the family it, it, it really bothers us I think more than you than the, than the public knows um, it's it's tough you don't want to see any more of it but firefighters hunt dead hunt Line of duty deaths are tough. Everybody goes differently. Uh, for me, Daryl was bad because one, Daryl saved me through quite a few. I mean, there's a couple times I've almost fallen through the floor and Daryl caught me. He
kind of solidified that I want to be here because, um, you know, it's it's a risk that we all take and we recognize that like nobody wants to to get hurt, but we would rather we get hurt than the general public. You know, like we take on that responsibility to rest to rescue and help other people so that you know you don't have to. And um, it just uh, definitely makes you be more aware of your circumstances and just kind of reaffirms to me why, why I wanted to do this and why I, I still want to do it. So. Definitely gives you a reality check that this job is real. It is dangerous. I mean, it's rough. It's rough on everybody. I didn't know. Daryl was the last firefighter we lost. I didn't really know him very well. I met him a few times. Heard nothing but good things about him. Um, but he was a vet. He he was on for a long time. And uh, and it just goes to show it doesn't matter if you're like a six month guy, you know, proby, or you know, if you're a you know, twenty five year vet, it's gonna it's dangerous for everybody. And it can happen to anybody at any time, no matter, you know, how well you're trained or or anything else. So it's uh it's definitely rough on everybody. This is the one alarm fire. Um, it was in a high rise. We arrived on the scene and uh Basically, all we were doing was getting our tools and getting ready to go up to the fire floor. Um, we got into the room, we secured the elevator um, to take the firefighters, us, up to where we needed to be. Uh, another company was, I guess when we got there, they were, I guess they, they got up there first and realized it was a uh, kitchen fire that uh, the sprinkler had uh, taken care of and put out the fire. So after that, it was just a matter of smoke and water removal. Um, we had to shut the sprinkler down so we could replace the head, but other than that, it was just smoke and fire and uh, water re removal. So it really wasn't a, really wasn't much to it. We didn't put anything out. Sprinkler took care of the job. On engine three, we were the first in engine. The captain did the size up. Uh, we went to the elevator. We had a little trouble recalling the elevator with our elevator keys. But once we got up there, Heavy Rescue 14 was already up there, and they said the fire was out. It was just a small fire. Show you what happened. So real quick. Come on, white shoes. Hello. 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 Engine 29 and truck 29. Man, it's so far. I have a couple of you guys and uh, get your appointment. It's set off that uh, sprinkler. Sprinkler extinguished the fire. Uh, you can see how the uh, see how the lights melted up there. Mm -hmm. So it set off that sprinkler and it extinguished everything. So did its job. There's always stuff going on. Uh, there's 
I don't even know how to explain it. You, you can't even, it's very hard to explain. Guys are having, trying to have fun. Watching them play football, basketball, <laughs> whatever you call it. Is that what you call it, football, basketball? Good. Uh, <laughs> little deep. A lot of the fun stuff is just stress relief because of the runs you make, but it's, uh, it's funny every day. There's stuff, people doing stuff weird to make another person laugh or, or relax somebody. It's, it's, a, it's, always a, it's always a good time. The audio is on. In the 24th house cooking uh, lunch via Randy Wittick. And we have a slight one alarm going on inside the grill. Common at the firehouse. They look, they look good, though. Uh, but, uh, and Ryan Schutowski just showed up with the, the water to put the fire out. We're going to throw some on there, though. It's going to flame up again. Hold on. you got to just throw it on there. It's tough to get some of the breaks yeah, in. Under control. Hey, that's more fire than what the 17s see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Hope the audio was going on that <laughs> Camaraderie is a huge thing around the firehouse. I mean, there's no doubt. We, you're basically here a third of your life, pretty much. I mean, we're here. I'm, we work 24 hours. We're off 48 hours. So it, it definitely becomes like a family. And there's a lot of stress that comes with the job, with making different runs or whatever. And if you don't break the tension with some uh, pranks is a good word, pranks, then uh, you know, tension would definitely get to you. So we we definitely have fun. We try to have fun. Everything we just talked about in general, the camaraderie, the, um, the helping people, the liking to come into work, the, all that together makes what, this job great. And it'll, it just this has got nothing to do with, with what we're kind of talking about, but I've been on here 22 years and he's been on 27. Um, and I've been off sick two times in 22 years, once for a death and once that I was sick. So you're going to find that with majority of this fire department they come to work and that just shows something you know we're not calling it sick we don't hate our job it's it's an incredible job and mostly because you feel good when you they won't admit it if they get down there and get all teary-eyed then then we'll kill them we'll get on them and give them barbs and things like that but uh, that's the part that keeps everybody going when they help somebody it's, i know it's an old saying but it's it's true